Hello, thrilled to be here. I'm uh, Abby Marsh from Georgetown University. Uh, I'll be talking today about this question of whether human nature is fundamentally selfish. Right? Are we actually as hopelessly self-absorbed as Narcissus, always focused on ourselves, and never genuinely driven by feelings of compassion or altruism? Uh, and today I'll be describing some evidence, uh, A, that people seem to believe this myth. It is quite widely believed. Um, and also that the myth that humans are, in fact, fundamentally selfish is no more true than the myth of Narcissus. Uh, if you do happen to believe that humans are fundamentally selfish, you're in good company, at least historically speaking. Aristotle argued 2,000 years ago that even when our actions seem to suggest we may be genuinely concerned about the welfare of others, in fact, all the friendly feelings extend to others from those that have the self primarily for their object. This view persisted for over a thousand years through the rise and falls of various empires until 1270 when Aquinas lamented that men pity such as are akin to them and the like because it makes them realize that the same may happen to themselves. The myth may have reached its apex with dour old Thomas Hobbes who claimed that no man giveth but with the intention of good to himself. Of all voluntary acts, the object is to every man who knows about women, don't think they cared, uh, but in any case, his own good. Uh, early psychologists like Freud and William James more or less concurred. James believed that uh, each mind to begin with must have a certain minimum of selfishness in the shape of instincts of bodily self-seeking in order to exist. And of course, we're all familiar with Dawkins' view that the best that we can do is try to teach generosity and altruism to our children because we are all born selfish. Because we are, in other words, fundamentally selfish. And it's not just the philosophers and scientists who believe this myth either. Ordinary people also seem to ascribe to this view. In 1990, uh, sorry, 1988, a national sample of over 2,000 American adults was asked whether the tendency of people to look out for their own interests is a serious problem in the United States. And 80% of them agreed that it was. Just this year, similar questions were posed to 1,000 British citizens who were asked what value they themselves place on compassionate values versus selfish values, and also what relative importance they think the average citizen of the UK places on these values. They presented the results as a ratio, a little bit to my frustration, but in any case, that's what we've got, so that the greater the final value, the more importance the person placed on compassionate values. And you can see that when it came to their own values, uh, respondents in this study said that they themselves cared much more about compassionate values like helpfulness and social justice than uh, selfish values like dominance over other people and wealth. But they reported that the typical British citizen places much more importance on selfish values, with almost half of the respondents saying that the typical citizen values selfishness more than compassion. And in follow-up interviews, the interviewers uh, had the respondents elaborate a little bit more on these views. And they said things like, in the society, we have a culture of self, not a culture of responsibility. Or it's all about me and my needs, not society's needs. Hopefully, though, you've noticed what the problem is with these bar graphs, right? Because the U bar is what people say that they actually value. And the typical bar is their estimate of what people actually value. Right? So you assume that if these bars are tapping into some actual reality of values, the bars should be the same. And the fact that they're not means that the respondents are either lying about what they themselves value or simply not representing the truth completely, or they're wrong about everybody else. So let's go ahead and assume the worst. We'll just give it a shot. Let's assume that the philosophers and the scientists and the respondents in these polls are right and that people as a group are fundamentally selfish. What would that mean? What would this fundamentally selfish every person look like? Well, uh, a fundamentally selfish person would at the very least be egocentric, right? They'd be primarily concerned with their own welfare. They would likely be Machiavellian as well. They would be coldly utilitarian and willing to manipulate or use other people to achieve their own needs. They would be irresponsible probably because what really beautifully selfish person would care about keeping their promises and commitments to other people if there was a good self-centered reason not to. They would almost certainly be callous to other people's misfortune or pain, maybe even willing to cause other people misfortune or pain if the need arose, if another person stood between them and their very important selfish goals. They might even be violent, aggression being a time-honored tactic for getting your own way when everything else fails. 
Although, importantly, they shouldn't be too obvious about any of these things. Because if other people think that you're some kind of monster, you don't actually get very far in achieving your own goals. So you very importantly have to leaven the whole thing with a little charm and deceptiveness as you go. And there we have it, right? We have the perfectly and fully self-centered individual. One who, I should add, fully meets all the diagnostic criteria for psychopathy. Right? This is an exact description of a psychopath. So what's psychopathy? Uh, in case you're not familiar with it, I'll just briefly describe it. Uh, first of all, it's a developmental disorder. All adult psychopaths started out as adults or children, uh, sorry, as adolescents or children with psychopathic traits. And there's some evidence that the earliest risk factors and uh, signs of psychopathy can be detected in very young children, which makes sense given how highly heritable psychopathy is. It has a heritability coefficient that's around 0.6, possibly higher. It's a common misconception that psychopathy is caused by uh, childhood trauma or abusive parents, but that's not true. The various risk factors for psychopathy, which aren't that well understood yet, but in any case, they combine to change how the brain develops in ways that are increasingly well understood. Research that my lab and others uh, have conducted shows that among the malformations in psychopathic brains includes uh, problems with the amygdala, such that the amygdala of psychopathic individuals tend to be smaller and less responsive to emotional stimuli, particularly fear-relevant stimuli, than those of a typical person. Uh, there are other places where there are abnormalities that include the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the white matter tracts that connect the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. Now, obviously, the reason that we call these variations in the psychopathic brain abnormalities is because they are, by definition, not normal. They're rare in the general population. We have rough estimates of how rare. Um, one study fairly recently evaluated hundreds of adults using the screening version of the psychopathy checklist. And they found that psychopathic traits are continuously, but not normally, distributed in the general population. Instead, they found what they call a half-normal distribution. So that most of the population, maybe 70%, had no psychopathic traits at all. A very small fraction, maybe 1%, fully meets the criteria for being a so-called psychopath. So what's that mean? Uh, first, it means that 70% of the population looks nothing like our prototypical psychopath. Right? Uh, they're not at all egocentric or Machiavellian or callous. They're not like a prototypically selfish person. And not just because they're lying or putting on a good show, because remember, psychopaths are also master manipulators and impression managers. So it actually looks like a big chunk of people just don't fit the selfish prototype, which is good. But it only gets us so far, because just saying that somebody's not psychopathic isn't a huge compliment. Um, it's not the same thing as saying that they're really legitimately compassionate. But 70% of the population is a lot of people. And this strange half-normal distribution suggests that maybe the psychopathy scale is not capturing all the possible variants in the human capacity for compassion and altruism. Maybe there's another half of the distribution that's not being captured of people who are not just not psychopathic, but even the opposite of psychopathic, people for whom concern for others' welfare is at least as important a motivator as concern for their own welfare. Uh, my group has spent the last six years or so conducting research with people who fit this description. They are altruistic kidney donors. These are people who have volunteered to undergo surgery to give a complete stranger their own kidney. Uh, this is actually one of the kidney donors that we've worked with. Um, this is him in a cameo in a Bon Jovi music video that he was in a little while ago. Uh, altruistic kidney donors like him have to undergo extensive psychiatric and medical screening before they donate. They can't receive any compensation, and on average, most of them end up uh, thousands of dollars in debt from the um, surgery. Not in debt, but thousands of dollars out from where they started. Uh, most go into the donation knowing that they may never meet their recipient afterwards, and a number of them don't ever meet their recipient. The risk of death from surgery is less than 1%. It's not that high, but it's not zero. And the risk of uh, experiencing excruciating pain after the surgery um, is nearly 100%. So these donations meet the most stringent definitions of altruism, and they are very rare. And the question has been for some time now, what drives these altruists to donate? The research my group has conducted thus far suggests that they may, in fact, inhabit the other end of this continuum, that they may be sort of anti-psychopaths. So for example, uh, whereas psychopaths have smaller and less responsive amygdalas, the amygdalas of the altruist are larger than average, and they're more responsive, especially to fearful expressions, which are interesting because they typically elicit compassion in people who see them. So what's this mean? 
It means that just as psychopathy results from variations in brain structures that support social and emotional responsiveness, like the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, so does altruism, which suggests that the capacity for altruism is just as deeply rooted in our basic biology as selfishness is. Um, and it's particularly worth noting today, certainly in light of the talks we've already heard, uh, that the capacity for altruism is thought to be built on the backs of these deep ancient structures that drive us to care for our children, that support the capacity to care for our children. And in fact, there's a very strong relationship between the amount of our parenting, a particular species does, the amount of um, care for children other than one's own, and how much altruism you see in a species, right? And this is true whether you're looking at meerkats or people. Um, and the fact that we are such a heavily our parental species suggests that altruism is very deeply built into our nature. And the fact that these parental care systems are so deep and fundamental is a great reminder, I think, that conferences like this should obviously be the norm, not the exception. We should be creating a world where caring for our children is not fundamentally in conflict with the other things that we're doing. Um, in any case, the variation that we've observed suggests that both altruism and psychopathy are expectable outcomes across the human population. And from an even broader perspective, what this means is that human nature is not any one thing. Right, the minute somebody starts a sentence with, human nature is, you can pretty much assume the answer is incorrect. Because people vary. And some people are genuinely selfish. That's true. Um, if we look, for example, at garden variety selfishness, these are data from a recent study by Dave Rand, where they found that when people are given the opportunity to divide a little money between themselves and a stranger, the proportion in this paradigm, hundreds of people, who were always selfish, they always kept it all for themselves, was a little over a third. Um, now, in this paradigm, the uh, choice was to either keep all of some amount of money or to give some of it away to an anonymous, faceless stranger who doesn't know who you are and who you'll never interact with. However, even in these pretty austere circumstances where there's not a lot of motivation to be generous, nearly half of the sample was generous to this nameless, faceless, anonymous stranger at least part of the time, up to half the time. And another chunk that was smaller but not that small was generous half or more of the time. So, more often than not, this 15% gave money that they otherwise could have kept for themselves to an anonymous stranger for no reason other than just sheer generosity, as far as we can tell. So that suggests that although altruistic kidney donors may be on the very far left side of the curve, much of the rest of the left-hand side is populated by plenty of other generous people. So the message from all of these lines of evidence, I think, is clear, is that some people may actually be predominantly selfish. But clearly not all people, or even most people. Um, having worked with people who are psychopathic for some time, I can tell you that they are exactly what a genuinely selfish person looks like. That is a thing that exists. But the whole point of having this designation, this term, psychopaths, is to distinguish them from everybody else who's not like that. Right? Thank goodness. So this interesting question then is why is it that some people, many people, believe that we are all selfish? I think there are a couple of possibilities. One is just negative bias, right? People place more weight on bad things than good things. This is a general phenomenon. And so we look around the world at people who are doing both good things and bad things. We're more likely to notice the bad ones and remember them and to see them as diagnostic, even though they're much rarer. Um, another is that we tend to believe that all people are like us, only a little bit worse, right? This is the, the classic Lake Wobegon effect. It's the widespread belief that we all have that we're just a little better than average. Um, and this is what the UK value study showed, right? That most people recognize their own compassionate feelings, but they have a little bit bleaker view of others. What's interesting is that these two values were correlated in the UK study, so that the people who have the most bleak view of others are some of the least compassionate people themselves. So if you truly believe that all people are fundamentally selfish, this may say more about you than about what people are actually like. Now, these biases have consequences. Um, and maybe the most significant is that believing that other people are not compassionate runs the risk of becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? If you believe that other people are just fundamentally selfish, how likely are you to trust them? And when trust erodes, so can engagement in all the civic and social institutions that rely on trust. Uh, and the UK Values Survey also found that people who believe others are the most selfish feel more alienated and less responsible for their communities. Uh, they're less likely to join meetings. They're less likely to vote. They're less likely to volunteer. But what I 
feel is true is that there's some good news to this, which is that preventing harmful consequences like this, in theory, actually could be pretty simple. It could be as simple as spreading the message that human nature is not actually fundamentally selfish. Thank you. I'll wrap up there.